Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That verse from Psalm 19, today's set psalm in the lectionary, is used by many a preacher as a prayer of dedication before they start their sermon. I thought it was appropriate as our call to worship today as we begin this reflection, which once again looks at how Christ, the Word of God, is living and active among us. Let us pray. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Many years ago I visited Rome and the Vatican. As with any other tourist location, the roads approaching the Vatican are thronged with visitors, and there are stalls and shops selling all manner of items. In the case of the Vatican, of course, many of those items are of a religious nature. You could buy t-shirts with pictures of the Pope on. You could buy a whole range of statues of saints from tiny miniature ones to life-sized. There was Pope on a rope soap, yes really, and pictures of various sorts. One of the pictures that I remember was a slightly creepy one showing the face of Jesus but it was a 3D image which meant as you moved around Jesus' eyes followed you around the room. The selling of religious items to pilgrims and tourists isn't new. In medieval times, pilgrims would buy badges, often in the shape of a scallop shell, the image of pilgrimage, and other keepsakes. Today, of course, many of our churches and cathedrals have bookstalls within them, and there's nothing wrong with all of this. Books and other items can open up faith to people in new ways. But in today's Gospel reading, we're going to hear of a very different sort of trading going on within a religious place, one that is excluding people from their worship of God. It comes from the second chapter of John's Gospel, and it's presented today by the Reverend Phil Summers. The Passover of the Judeans was near, and Jesus made his way up to Jerusalem. And in the temple there, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers sat around at their tables. Making a whip out of cords, he, he drove out the sheep and the cattle. The, the money that belonged to the money changers, he, he poured out, he overturned their tables. And to those who were selling doves, he said, take these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for my house will eat away at him. The Judeans then challenged him, saying, what sign can you show us for doing these things? And Jesus replied, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. And the Judeans said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, what was going on in the Jerusalem temple wasn't about selling souvenirs to pilgrims. It wasn't about selling things in a holy place either. 
Bookshops and gift shops in cathedrals and churches, as I've already said, are fine and open up the faith in new ways to people. And in any case, purchasing from gift shops is optional. What caused the anger of Jesus in that reading is something else. The Judaism of the day, very different to today, had a sacrificial system that was based at the temple in Jerusalem. To seek forgiveness, a sacrifice at Passover was encouraged. Now the first thing someone had to do when they entered the temple was to change their money. Roman coins carried an image of Caesar, and Caesar claimed to be God, so those coins in the temple were regarded as blasphemous. They had to be changed for special temple coins, and the exchange rate wasn't exactly favourable. Those coins were then needed to buy an animal for sacrifice. A pigeon was the cheapest, then there were doves, and then it worked its way all the way up to goats and sheep and cattle. All these could be bought again at inflated rates. Well, maybe you could take your own then, you think. Well, you couldn't take your own, because the animal for sacrifice had to be perfect, and the temple authorities would soon find a blemish or two on any that were brought in from outside by pilgrims. It wasn't only sacrifice that had to be perfect. If you had a skin disease, were bleeding, or had certain disabilities, you wouldn't be admitted either. All of this practice was exclusive. The poor and the sick were being denied access to the customs and life and worship of the temple. That's what made Jesus angry. It was on the Monday that religion got in the way. An outsider would have thought that it was the pet shop's fire sale, and the outsider in some ways wouldn't have been far wrong. Only it wasn't household pets. It was pigeons that were being purchased. And it wasn't a fire sale. It was a rip-off stall in a holy temple, bartering birds for sacrifice and the price was something only the rich could afford. No discounts to students, pensioners, disabled types, or UB40 cardholders. Then he, the holiest man on earth, went through the bizarre bazaar like a bull in a china shop. So the doves got liberated, and the pigeon sellers got angry. And the police went crazy, and the poor people clapped like mad, because he was making a sign that God was for everybody, not just for those who could afford him. He turned the tables on Monday, the day that religion got in the way. This event occurs in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark and Luke place it in the week leading up to the Jewish feast of Passover and the events of the Last Supper, after which Jesus is arrested, tortured and crucified. What happens in the temple is the setting for the final conflict between Jesus and the religious authorities. As we heard in the reading a short while ago, John places this event just before Passover too, but it's at least two years before the events of the crucifixion. There are two more Passovers to come yet in John's Gospel. This one, when Jesus casts the money changers out of the temple, Jesus celebrates in Jerusalem. The following year, he's back home in Galilee for Passover. And then he's back in Jerusalem again for the events that will lead up to his death. 
there's another big difference between the Gospels. Matthew, Mark and Luke portray the Passover meal as being the Last Supper on the Passover day itself. In John, the time scale is different. Jesus dies on the cross on the feast of Passover itself. At the very moment that the sacrificial animals are being slaughtered in the temple, Jesus dies on the cross. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. But we've skipped two years. Let's go back to that first of the Passovers recorded in John's Gospel. The second half of our reading today hinted at the conflict with the religious authorities. They ask Jesus for a sign to explain what he's doing. They didn't expect his answer, which was, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Three days, they must have thought. It's taken a lifetime, 46 years, to build. Only later, after that third Passover in John's Gospel, do the disciples fully realise what Jesus means. His life destroyed on the cross after three days raised from the dead. Jesus is referring to himself, his body, as the temple. Now the Jerusalem temple in the days of Jesus was regarded as the dwelling place of God and for many was the very focus of their faith. But at the end of the day it was just stones one stone on top of another, on top of another. Where is the focus of our faith? Is our faith focused on bricks and stones of our churches? Is our faith focused on systems and traditions, money changers and sacrifice sellers? All that got in the way of worship in Jesus' day. What obstructions and difficulties do our rules and traditions impose on those who seek to know God more today? God in Jesus Christ dwells not in bricks and stones, prayer books and pews, but in each and every one of us. We are the temples of our faith. Let us worship the Christ when we meet each other. For God in Christ dwells in us, not in buildings. Lord, you know our hearts and minds. We don't need fancy words to speak to you. We don't need fine clothes to meet with you. When we put conditions on how to worship, when the instruction manual becomes our gospel, when we put obstacles in the path of those who would come to you, forgive us. Your anger in the temple shows us how much you care, that everyone is welcome that you are wherever we are. You are love unlimited, always accessible. We are grateful that we can turn to you in the dead of night, from the depths of our lowest moments, and know that we will find love, understanding, comfort, and acceptance just as we are thank you amen 
As always, thank you for being part of this reflection today. And there is, of course, a written version on the resource website. Until next week, take care, stay safe, and remember that the best of all, God is with us.